Tonight on Our Century, the agony and the ecstasy of being an Aussie teenager, when those hormones take control. What are the in words this year? Guess and crowd. Screaming your head off at a concert. Showing off to the girl next door. Or just taking a cold shower. When you first fell in love, or just dreamed about it. Tonight, the terrible teens. For all those who can remember. Back at the start of our century, places like this one here would have been absolutely unthinkable. I mean, you can't have the cafe without the teenagers. And teenagers, well, they hadn't been invented. They were just grown-ups and they were children, that's all. But here, you have what became the teenage symbols. The car, maybe the guitar, but always the music, the top 40. And music gave us the teenage milestones. I remember the day that Buddy Holly died. I was shattered. I wanted to leave school. Remember the first record that you bought? Was it Elvis, or Abba, maybe John Farnham? Do you remember your favourite singer way back then? And do you remember the music they played on the radio, maybe in the car, when you got your first kiss? His name was Johnny O'Keefe, or J.O.K. to his adoring fans. He became an icon for young Australians in the late 50s and early 60s. He was young, he was brash, and he was rebellious. He was different. They called him the Wild One. J.O.K. sang the local version of rock and roll the American sensation that swept Australia after the war. Well, dig me, you're a real square. Move over and make way for a cat that's really hip to rock, rock, right around the clock. The social revolution had erupted, one that would open up a generation gap between adults and children, a gap that was filled by a new, more independent and more affluent creature called the teenager. In the early part of our century, the word teenager didn't even exist. Pubescent boys and girls were breaking out, of course, but they're often just younger versions of their parents. Once you left school, sometimes as young as 12, you were expected to be all grown up, expected to pay your way in the family. Whether they were married or unmarried, most young people live with their parents, and mum and dad had a say in everything. What you did, where you went, even what clothes you wore. When a girl was trussed into her first corset, she became a woman. Listen, Sarah, you've got to realise I'm a man now. Here, and when a boy grew fluff on his chin, well, he was a man. Whiskers! Oh, gee, Bill! Young men and women were kept apart as much as possible. And when those teenage hormones started to kick in, kids were encouraged to keep active, to play sport, do anything to distract them and burn up all that energy. Some things, of course, never change. In the early part of our century, the years dominated by war and by depression, adolescence was also a roller coaster ride of emotion and discovery. <laughs>
World War II and Australia became a playground for American troops based in the Pacific. But before the jungles and the Japanese, it was party time for the GIs and a turning point for Aussie teenagers. Suddenly we were blitzed by American pop culture, the dance and the dress of downtown USA. For the young blokes, fashion was a slick, shiny outfit called the zoot suit. And girls wore tight gabardine skirts with a split up the back for fast dancing. The new look came with a new name and with attitude. I'm a budgie. I'm a Ouija, so what? We'd won the war, but there was a new invasion. <laughs> Well, frankly, I can't see anything wrong with the budgies and Ouija's. When I was young, we were Charleston crazy, and to my way of thinking, the children are just going through another phase. But this was a phase that worried many parents. They felt they were losing control of where their kids went and what they got up to. Barrel people thought that because they were quiet and respectable, their daughter couldn't go wrong. Going about with Ada wasn't doing Beryl any good. But luckily, I knew her family. So that night, I called on Mr. and Mrs. Bradley. Well, Mrs. Bradley, do you know where Beryl is tonight? Why, yes, she's at the pictures with Ada. You're sure? Oh, yes. They seem to spend all their time at the pictures. She's never content with her own home. She's always got to be out with that Ada. Why is she come at the pictures? We'll stay in at the train. Stay down at my place. Well, she found out. Oh, you can't be a mummy's girl all your life. Oh. As young people began to make their own decisions, the next rebellion was just around the corner. In the early years after the war, Australia was a young, vibrant nation on the move. Work was easy to find, and by 1954, every 15-year-old who wanted one had a job. With money to spend, teenagers focused on fun. It didn't take long for big business to size up this new generation as a gold mine. So products were made just for teenagers. Music was life, and it was also portable. No longer the sounds of silence. The big American record companies packaged up the latest overnight teen sensation and sent them out to conquer the world. It was rampant froth and frenzy in Melbourne when Fabian arrived, all teeth and hair. There are 30 police on duty, and it looks as though they need 30 more. The police had learnt a lesson by the time the travelling man Ricky Nelson hit town. The youngsters have to be kept in their place by the strong arms of the law. Nelson was a teen idol, a recording star. But more importantly, Ricky was also one of Ozzie and Harriet's two favourite sons. The Nelsons was a TV hit. And in 1956, television invaded our lounge rooms. TV Channel 9 is the call sign of General Television Corporation Proprietary Limited and will soon be the call sign for the top entertainment in Australian television. They're gonna be some quaking and a whole lot of shaking. Everybody, it's a six o'clock. TV salesmen gave teenagers their very own shows. Swinging everybody, it's a six o'clock. By the end of the 50s, the youth market was worth about 300 million pounds. As teenagers splurged on clothes and on leisure and entertainment. Fads and fashion changed on a whim. What you wore, what you look like, what kind of music you listen to could brand you straight away. Rockers were a variation on the bodgy theme. They took their look from 50s screen idols like James Dean and Marlon Brando. Said, 
The motorbikes and the leather jackets were the fashion accessories for some working class teenagers. The papers had a field day, depicting them as delinquents and rebels without a cause. At Sydney Showground, there's a monster stomp, and there are about 20,000 monsters, sorry stompers, showing just how it should be done. It's the newest dance craze, but if you're easily embarrassed, it's not for you. After all, some people just don't like treading on other people's corns. In the 60s, the natural enemy of the rocker was the surfing. The beach, like the bush, was part of our culture. The cutoffs and the cozies were as Australian as the kangaroo. Summer holidays meant the surf and the sand, and if you got lucky, a sizzling romance. Or else, you could just lie in your towel and dream. Suddenly in the mid-60s, we were hit by a musical tidal wave, all the way from Merseyside in England. Liverpool took over from Los Angeles. The Beach Boys were wiped out by the Beatles. It's a long way from Melbourne to Liverpool, and the road that is now top of the chart throughout the world. Red-blooded Aussie boys let their hair down and let it grow, just like John and Paul and George and Ringo. And our girls started dressing in miniskirts, the latest fashion from London's Carnaby Street shops. Now from AWA. It was yet another new look and yet another new language. What are the in words this year? Um, gas, king, great, bad. Words like grouse and gas and things like that, they're all stupid. Carnaby 7, Carnaby 8, and the swinging bridge. From AWA. Wow. 1965, the year when Australia, with a population of about 11 million, bought more than 10 million records. The year when Australian artists competing against the best in the world put five records in the list of the 10 top sellers. Uh, 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 By the mid-60s, Australian teenagers were no longer just chooks, following overseas trends. We started hatching a few roosters of our own. Right now, I thought we might play the record that you got the great second gold record for. OK. Why not? Why not? Yeah. Normie Rowe was one local idol whose face plastered the walls of teenage bedrooms. And suddenly it seemed teenagers were getting younger. Mostly girls with pocket money to burn, they became known as teeny boppers. <laughs> and now, even before they got pimples, they got a say in the fashions. <laughs> Can I borrow the car? Will I Into the 1970s, and a boom in apartment blocks saw many older teenagers leave the family nest before they got married. Then I heard the, black man blue, they really blew. the sexual revolution had arrived. So with some friends we made a stand and found out They'd always been old enough to die in war. Now in 1973, 18-year-olds were given the vote. And school habits had changed too. Now most Australian 16-year-olds stayed on at school. More and more teenagers were going off to university. Students became the new revolutionary leaders. Sure, our function at school is to learn, but in order to learn properly, we have to be allowed to function as human beings. The gap between generations seemed to be getting wider. Young people who'd known only about peace and the pill now wanted to learn more about love. 
1974, the Victorian hamlet of Sunbury became the site of our first big pop festival. Rock and roll and you're still doing it now. 30,000 would-be flower children took their clothes off for a weekend of music, merriment and mud baths. Along with the beads and the hippie culture came the bongs and the drug culture. Illegal drugs had been used for most of our century. What made the 70s different was that they were being flaunted and pushed for the first time. Johnny! Oh, come on, pot's okay. It's non-addictive. It's only the beginning of the problem, man. Squares who call it a problem only show they don't know the first thing about it. Go on, try it. No, thanks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the African Green Chats Room. My name's Angie, and I'd like to say hello to everybody here tonight. Most Australian teenagers went back to doing what they'd always done. Which is all we get stuck into this one because it's really good. But by now, they were doing it to a disco beat. In this case, it's, it's different than other places, you know? Like, if you get to the pictures, you, you hardly pick up anyone there because you're all sitting down. At a disco, you move around and that's... Uh, you see him dancing, so you go up and dance beside him and say, do you like to dance, you know? I think the guys who go to discos thinking that there's going to be a lot of girls there that they can just snap their fingers and they'll come running to them. Hot dog thing. Some things, as they say, never change. Only where you do it. And boyfriends had to be watched carefully, especially if they came equipped with the dreaded panel van. Good day. Hello. Hi. Hi. Mum, this is Bruce. How do you do, Bruce? Come meet Dad. Yeah, well, I check you later, Mrs. Vickers. Over our century, fads and fashions have come and gone. But teenage boy meets teenage girl. That has been a constant problem. This year old man must be loaded. Nice curtains, Bruce. I'll give him. I made them. See you around, Mrs. Vickers. Yes. Goodbye, Bruce. Yeah, bye. Bye, Mum. Don't be too late, home, Deborah. Bye, Mum. Bye, sweetheart. Bye, Dad. <laughs> What she sees in him. He's got nothing going for it. I reckon he's an idiot. In the 1980s, the carefree teen years took a turn for the worse. The days of full employment had gone. Jobs for kids became part time rather than full time. And for many, there were no jobs at all. Years of sexual freedom caught up with us too. And all of a sudden, if it wasn't on, then it wasn't on. As we headed into the 90s, music and fashion changed to reflect the meaner mood out there on the streets. Through most of our century, teenagers have tried to cut loose, tried to do their own thing free from their parents' generation. Yet as we reach the end of our century, it could easily be argued that older people still call the shots. The magistrate needed to find circumstances so exceptional as to warrant Adam and Amy getting married. In the 1990s, for example, the so-called permissive age, old rules still apply. At 17, Amy was pregnant, old enough to have a baby, but too young to marry her boyfriend until they battle through the courts. Adam, you may kiss your bride. <laughs> Yet the funny thing is, back in the 40s, when a girl marries could be as young as 12. Youngest of four daughters of this Marrickville, Sydney family was Joanne Davey, who was 12 last January and left school only two weeks ago. To the accompaniment of more publicity than the biggest society marriage, Joanne became Mrs. Jim Moores. He is 25. They've been dancing partners since Joanne was eight. That's how they appeared four years ago, when boy met girl. We've been pals together for over four years, and now that I'm Mrs. Moores, I think we should continue that way.
Amazing stuff, isn't it? Not your normal teenage love affair. But what's normal? For many teenagers in our century, normal was going off to war. For many others, more recently, it's been looking for a job. Being a teenager has always been a time of highs and lows, of confusion and of just coping with all the changes. Maybe we forget the problems and the pain way back then. But ask any adult and they'll usually smile and they'll roll their eyes and they'll say, they were great times. The risks and the romance before life got serious.